John chapter 17, we'll spend our, our time there this morning. Um, the slide you see, hopefully, a uh, slide or two, is a picture of, of our two older children. There we, go. there we go. All right, that's David and Lauren. Some of you know them. Uh, on that side is them as adults. But this is a picture of us probably back when we first moved to Romania, judging from the uh, quality of the rug they were on. Um, and so they're four and two, uh, but they're wearing clothes that belong to Karen and me, as you can tell. They, they just don't fit, they're way too big. Uh, but they did make it to adulthood despite that fashion choice. Um, and I, I put that up there and chose to begin today because it really describes how I feel dealing with this text that declares truths to us that we celebrate and believe and delight in, and yet they really defy understanding. And so I really feel today like, like a child in his parents' clothes, so I hope you'll, you'll bear with me. Our text this morning is a, is a prayer of Jesus. It's not the same prayer as, as we read in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where he's in Gethsemane crying, you know, Abba, Father, let this cup pass from me. But it's, it's a different prayer. Some call it a priestly prayer because the, the tone of it is, is like a priest who is preparing to offer a sacrifice for his people, and that is exactly what Jesus is preparing to do. I hope to preach three messages from John 17, but only one today, okay? So don't, don't panic. <laughs> you may feel like it's three, but at least as far as I think, you know, to me, I think it's just one. But um, I would love, as, uh, as I have further opportunity, just to continue through John 17. I'm just struck by the truths that are here and really pray that, that the Lord will be pleased just to awaken in us a sense of of delight in who he is and, and what he has done for us and just to, to trust and, and love him, serve him. So as we listen in on what Jesus prays in, in the passage that Eunice read for us, we see that he makes two requests. He makes a request in, in verse 1. In verses 2 and 3 tell us why. And then in verse 5 he makes another request, but the reason is in verse 4. So that's a little bit about, about where we're going. As we do this, we gain some amazing insight into his relationship with the Father. And again, just to, as a way of meditating on that, to, to, if God is pleased, to awaken in us a sense of delight in who he is. So let's look in verse 1. First, you get a bit of the setting. It says that Jesus spoke these things. So what things had Jesus spoken? You know the chapter headings, the numbers and things, they're not inspired, right? All of, all of Scripture is God's Word, but somebody else put the numbers in that... It helps us find things quickly. Um, so this continues straight from John 16, but if we look back to John chapters 14 to 16, or really even go back to 13 where he washed the disciples' feet, he's talked about a lot of things with them. He's talked about the Holy Spirit who will soon be poured out on God's people. He's talked about the disciples' relationship to him, like, like branches to a vine, about their relationship to the Father and to the Spirit. He's talked about their relationship to the world. He said, you'll be hated by them for my sake. Uh, he's talked about, as we move into, the, toward the end of chapter 16, he's, he, he talks about them having bold, confident prayer in his name. And he talks again about his departure, as he did several times through there. And then he talks, uh, toward the end he says, okay, the hour's coming, has already come, you will be scattered each to his home to leave me alone. So all of you will abandon me. I've invested three years of my life into you, and you will abandon me. But I'm not alone, the Father's with me. And then he says, but, you know, cheer up. They'll have peace because he has overcome the world. So just imagine uh, the tension of what has been dropped on them in the, in the past few hours as they have absorbed all that he has said. He's, he's talked about the spirit who's coming as he's talked about his own departure in sort of vague terms, but clearer and clearer terms. And, and they begin to get it. And there, there is the, the sadness of all of that. There is the, the shocking news that, that they will soon abandon him. He's already predicted his betrayal. And, and so there are all kinds of questions, all kinds of, of heavy things that, that are on their hearts now. And then he just ends it with this uh, cheer up. <laughs> In me you'll have peace. I've overcome the world. And now I'm going to pray. And he prays a uh, prayer shorter than, than Andrew, especially with the reset. <laughs> it's it's uh, you know, just a, quite a brief prayer. And then off they march where he has the Gethsemane prayer. He's arrested, tried, crucified. And so these, these events are 
right on him. And so that helps us get a, a bit of the, the transition that we're in. It says that he lifted his eyes to heaven. He looked upward. This is the, the posture of humility. Notice just what an easy transition it is for Jesus to move from speaking to his close friends to speaking to his father. You know, we tend to make those transitions really rough and awkward. You know, we stop and bow and real change of pace and, and, and that's okay. But for me, it, it spoke to the intimacy that he had both with people and with the father. He could, for him, it was uh, in some ways, it's just all about sharing life. And he turns from speaking to his close friends, lifting his eyes to heaven, uh, looking upward, the, the posture of intimacy, right? Most of the time we, we bow and close our eyes, and that's fine. There, there's no prescribed prayer posture in the Bible. Typical in Jesus' day for people to stand, eyes lifted to heaven. That's good. It's like a, an adoring child looks up at her parents until she learns to roll her eyes, which, you know, happens in our house about, you know, about 14. And, uh, and so, uh, but there is that stage when they're about four, when they just look at you like, you know, you are an amazing person. And um, then about the time they're 14, they say, how do you get dressed all by yourself? But uh, uh, eventually, we're looking forward to recovering from that. He begins his prayer in verse 1 simply with Father. And we're so accustomed to beginning our own prayers this way and hearing this that, that we sort of become blind and different, callous to the fact that when you get to the core of who God is, he's a Father. This life-giving, sacrificial God, who, who is relational. He is, he is our Father. And Jesus approaches him not in a, a philosophical, theological category as much as relational. Father, it's, it's, it's beautiful. And then he says, the hour has come. Now, if you look in, uh, in John chapter 8, verse 20, if you read John's gospel, you know that this phrase occurs a number of times. Um, the farther, the more you progress through John's gospel, the more it, it zeroes in on the hour being the hour of his, his suffering, the, of this whole three-day period in which he is arrested, tried, crucified, and, and raised. But I just want to point out just a couple of examples of how John uses it. John chapter 8 and verse 20, it, he was teaching in the temple, and it says, no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. So not because he was expert at evasive maneuvers, but simply because it was not time. The hour had not yet come. John chapter 13 and verse 1, as John introduces the, the episode of washing the disciples' feet, it's, he introduces it like this. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. So all of this is known to him. Everything is coming to this point. Everything he has done in his earthly ministry has, has brought him to this point. Every moment with his family in early years, every moment of Learning the scriptures as a, you know, growing in wisdom, stature, favor with God and man. Every moment of, of doing teaching and miracles. Every moment of investing, not just in crowds and disciples. It comes to this point. And so he realizes and understands this, this is it. Everything comes to what is about to happen. It's already happening. Judas is likely already with the, the Jewish leaders negotiating the, the price of betrayal. And so it is... It is in motion. They are maybe on their way, even as he is praying this. This is, this is happening. It's, uh, you, you think about the, the magnitude of what he is about to bear, of the, of the sins of the world to be laid on his shoulders. As, as he says at the end of 16, you will all abandon me. You'll all go to your homes. But I am not alone. The Father is with me. And yet on the cross, he will cry out, right? Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Oh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That, that cry that, that gets a response as the dead are raised and the, the soldier confesses, but that's, that'll be another sermon. So, these things are in motion. They are happening. They are, they are certain. This is, this is it. Everything comes to this point. And you may feel like that even that today. You may be at a, a moment like that in your life today. Everything comes to this point. You may be facing a major decision. I don't know, but I would say this. All that God has done in... Your life up to this point has brought you into this room today by his design. And uh, I just pray I don't blow it. So <laughs> um, let's look then at his first request. He says in verse 1, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. Now to glorify often means to, to give honor, to praise to someone. And I think that's, that's pretty close to its meaning here. As we read John's gospel, sometimes it carries a slightly different meaning. And I'll quote uh, Leon Morris. 
He said it like this, Glory, real glory, is to be seen in lowly service. When someone who is high and powerful chooses to leave that secure and comfortable place in order to engage in a piece of humble service, that is real glory. Boy, what a, what a beautiful description of what Jesus did for us in, in taking on humanity, suffering the way he did, and, and embracing that and calling it glory. So we could understand that as Jesus says, glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. It is like he is asking, he's looking ahead to what is about to happen, to the arrest and the trials and the the scourging and the the crucifixion, bearing the wrath of of the nations on himself as the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It is as if he is saying, Father, give me the honor of bearing the sins of the people that I might honor you by giving them life through my death. Just let that sink in a minute. He looks ahead to being arrested, bound, tied, beaten, scourged, rejected by his people. In that joint purpose with the Father, abandoned as he pays the price for our sin. And he says, Father, give me the honor of doing this. Can you imagine? I read this and I just fall on my knees physically or (laughs) mentally that he would call it an honor, that he would ask the Father for the honor of suffering, that he might honor the Father by giving life through those sufferings to, to to those people. And so we need to understand that that Jesus didn't win the Father's love for us, he came because the Father loved for us. Jesus did not, did not win the favor of an angry deity by his death. He came, First John 4 says, and this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the sacrifice that turns away wrath for, for our sin. But it also gives us tremendous insight into the relationship between Jesus and his Father. He is eternally in a father-son relationship with God the Father. Wow, it's exciting stuff, right? (laughs) It is. It is. They are completely focused on each other. It's amazing. I mean, it's it's beautiful. So we look in verse 5. We see a shared glory. We'll talk more about verse 5 in a minute, but for now, just refer to it. Now, Father, glorify me together. And I'm reading from uh, New American Standard because it it really brings out the the shared glory that, that both Father and Son have. He says, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the foundation of the world. There is, there is shared glory. Again, this, this honor, this focus, this, this gravitas, this, this focus on each other, it's, it's shared. There's shared life. In verse 10, he says, all that I have is yours and all you have is mine. There is, there is shared life. There is shared joy. In verse 13, he says, I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Have you thought about God as joyful? He is. And there is shared love. Verse 24, he says, you loved me before the creation of the world. Isn't that amazing? So this relationship between father and son is one of shared glory and life and joy and love. It's it's beautiful. And it's, it's not selfish. It's, it's other sin. How can there be one God focused in love, in sacrificial love? It is because that is how he exists, as Father and Son and Spirit. So there never has been a time, nor will there ever be a time, in the existence of the one true God that he did not exist as Father, Son, and Spirit. Now, the Spirit's not mentioned here. You've already noticed that. Some of you are already planning to catch me after service. Say, hey, you missed, you missed the, you know, number three. <laughs> it's like, I know he's not mentioned there. But he's mentioned abundantly, chapters 14 to 16. In John 16, 14, Jesus said this, The Spirit will glorify me, there's that word again, for he will take what is mine and reveal it to you. And so what we should understand is when we see the Father and Son mentioned, the Spirit is, is conspicuous by his absence. He is sort of, in a sense, behind the scenes, pointing us to Jesus, both as he inspired John to hear and, and write this text for us, and even today as we hear this text and are taught by it. 
The Spirit is, is pointing us to Jesus. He is pushing Jesus to the forefront. And so we don't need to be troubled if the Spirit isn't mentioned here. Now, that for centuries, the shorthand for this relationship among Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this shared life and love and glory and joy, we call it Trinity, Tri-Unity, which makes, you know, it's, it's almost nonsensical or illogical, right? One plus one plus one, apologies to math teachers, today it's one, okay? There is God who exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, it may sound like a, a technical theolo- theological term, but it is so much more than that. It's so important for us that we have some level of understanding of it. Michael Reeves says this, the truth is that God is love because God is a trinity. For it is only when you grasp what it means for God to be a trinity that you really sense the beauty, the overflowing kindness, and the heart-grabbing loveliness of God. How many of you think about the trinity and you think heart-grabbing loveliness? (laughs) But it is, it is, it is that. There is such, such beauty, such delight in this. Father, Son, and Spirit sharing joy, life, glory, love. It's amazing. So out of this, this shared glory and life and joy and love overflows in creation. Leslie mentioned it as she was leading us in the musical part of our worship, right? The opening pages, opening words of Genesis Tell us, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So there's God. We understand as the Father. The Spirit is, is hovering over the face of the deep. And it says, God said, let there be light. There is the Word. We, again, I'm reading New Testament into Old here. Apologies to Old Testament scholars. But, uh, you know, I think we see a hint of it there. Father, the Word, the Son, and the Spirit. He created a world for His children to live in. Do you know how perfect this world is for us to live in. Do you know how beautiful it is? Do you know how much stuff there is in this world we'll never get around to using and enjoying? I mean, the sheer abundance of what God has created. It, it is astounding. And it is for His children to enjoy because He loves us. Isn't that amazing? Why would He do that? We hadn't done anything. It didn't even exist. We hadn't done anything. And yet, here He is in His generosity and kindness He creates a world out of that same glory and life and joy and love. He creates people to love. Not primarily to love Him, but for Him to love. It is is this overflow of this life within God that moves Him to create people more to love. And that includes giving to them, to us, the capacity to disobey because... Love can't be forced, has to be willing. So we're, we're by no means robots in that. And out of that same glory and joy and life and love, when humanity disobeyed, when we, when we turned from father love to self-love, because understand, we didn't stop loving. When Adam and Eve sinned, we didn't stop loving. We just began loving ourselves more than, more than God. That's, that is it. But when that happened, the father loved us still, acted to save us, ultimately by sending His Son. The Father arranged it. The Son accomplished it. The Spirit applied it. We accept it. Great, beautiful outline, four A's. It's awesome. So the Trinity, far from being a a dry theological term, if it is for you, I I hope today changes that. Far from being something that that seems technical or theological, it it should be life-giving. It's just shorthand for, for who God is. But it is the great divide between other religions and life in Christ. There are groups that falsely call themselves Christian. That is, they claim to be part of Christianity but are not. And I'm, I think specifically of two groups that are active here in Prague, that's the Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. They either deny or distort this truth, the Trinity, that God exists as Father, Son, and Spirit. And there are other religions that will say there is one God, but there cannot be a Son or Spirit that is God in the same way. And... Um, <laughs> Encounter some Jehovah's Witnesses one day and tried to engage them in check, and I, I think they almost signed me up. I thought, okay, we need to go into English. I'm not, I'm not being clear. We're agreeing on far too much. So, fun conversation. Anyway, uh, there are other religions that, that will say there, there's only one God, but, but Son and Spirit cannot be God in the same way. That, that ruins the, the, the unity of God. But listen, all of these other groups fail in this way. 
that this one God, if there is no Son, no Spirit that is God in the same way, He cannot be loved because there is no one to love. With no one to love, such a God can only love Himself. And if He only loves Himself, He cannot create children to love. He can only create slaves. He is not a father. He is a ruler who creates slaves. And this cannot awaken in us real love and real delight and real joy. We need a God who is Father, Son, and Spirit, who who understands from eternity past what love and joy and glory and life really are. And so, a God like this who is solitary, who can only love Himself, He's only a ruler who can create slaves. He can't create love or delight in us. He can create gratitude because He's a ruler. So He's like the policeman who, if you're driving, pulls you over and you know you're guilty and you know you deserve punishment, but He doesn't make you pay a fine. You're grateful to the ruler who let you off the hook. And that is all that that these other views of God can give you is gratitude that I'm off the hook. Gratitude that life could be worse, but it's not. It can't awaken in you this life-giving joy and delight. That's not delight in the Lord. And as I, as I reflect on this, I've had to check my own heart and my own gratitude because I desire to be grateful and model that and, and have that attitude in my own heart. Am I just thanking God because I'm off the hook? Am I just thanking God because like He's a ruler who's not punishing me? Or is He my Father who is good? This is the difference between being thankful for good things and thankful in all things, Right? If God's a ruler who just lets you off the hook, you're thankful for good things. Oh God, that could have been a lot worse. I deserve hell. Thank you, I'm not in hell. That could have been a lot worse. Thank you that it it wasn't worse. But gratitude before the Father, delight in the Father, can thank God in in any circumstance because you understand you have a Father in heaven who is good and wise and life-giving and is working out the circumstances of your life for His glory and your good. So, we've seen what he asked for. Now we're going to see why. Yeah, I'm watching the clock. So, why did Jesus make this request of the Father? His request is grounded in the common purpose he has with the Father, and that is to save a people. He says in verse 2, You granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. So, what this tells us is the Father... For creation, he granted to Jesus the authority authority over everyone who would ever live, everyone who would be created. That authority is for a purpose to grant life to those whom the Father had given to Jesus to give life. So out of this shared glory and life and joy and love before the world was created, the Father gave to Jesus this authority for this purpose to give life. Now, in the next few verses, we'll see that Jesus describes his followers this way as those whom you've given me. But the context in these verses is broader, and and also at the end of the prayer, it's broader than those those first followers. And and it points us to all of humanity and something that took place, humanly speaking, trying to describe this, before he ever created the world. So this leads us to the conclusion that the, the ultimate factor in our salvation is God's choice of us. I see frowns and clouds forming already. Now, this may trouble some of us. Honestly, first time I I encountered this, it troubled me too. I was a new believer, went to a Bible study, university student, so I knew pretty much everything. Uh, Went to a Bible study, and this old evangelist said something about this issue, and I pushed back. I argued, you know me. I've never been one to let ignorance keep me from saying something, right? Right? So, so I pushed back and I argued, and I got home that night and was mad, and I got up the next morning and said, I am going to open my Bible and get my concordance, you know, the, the book that tells you, you know, where verses occur, and I'm going to prove this old bird wrong, because that stuff's just not there. And it took about 10 minutes with my concordance to realize I was seriously mistaken, and uh, had a lot more to learn, I'm still learning. But I'm thankful that uh, that that old evangelist became a good friend, became a mentor to me. He's with the Lord now. 
had a huge influence in my life. I've never met anybody who modeled better. Really what I'm pleading for today is simply a, a delight in who God is as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Never met anybody like that. Name was R.F. Gates. I probably, you know, outside of Louisiana, a few people even knew him. But, oh my, what a, what a delightful brother. So if, if this does trouble you, first you need to know it troubles most of us, at least at the beginning. But I, I find it very encouraging. Let me give you just a couple of things that, that may encourage you to, to, to not be troubled by it, but to be encouraged by it. First, if it's in Scripture, it is given not to trouble us, but to help us. It's not given us just so we will have something to argue about, as if we don't have enough to do. All the discussions are interesting, but, you know, it's okay. I remember teaching in Romania. The subject came up. A student asked a question about it, and I, I shut the classroom door. I said, you can ask any question. We'll talk about it. You know, hold your rocks till the end. When I get finished, I'll stand still, and you can throw anything you want. But I said, when the bell rings and the door opens, we're all friends and brothers, and it's all good. And so we we're able to have some good discussions about these things, and that's okay. But just understand it's there, and it's not given in order to trouble us. It's given to, to encourage us and to help us. And if, if God did this, it's, it's for our good. And what he did is good and right, so you can trust him in this. Second, if, if I understand this rightly, it means the Father didn't begin to love you when you started behaving, uh, when you showed up at church, when you started doing right things, when you came to Christ, even when you were born. But even before he said, let there be light, he loved you. Isn't that amazing? It's beautiful. It is, it is unshakable. It gives a foundation to your life that nothing can disturb. Because there are things that will happen in your life and, and the, the whole house may be destroyed, but the foundation remains. And I'm telling you, this is a part of that foundation. Third thing is, is this is not only for our salvation, not only for eternal life, but it's for the advance of the gospel. That's a lot of the pushback people give. It's like, well, if I believe that, why, why worry about the evangelism and all that? But Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians 2, We ought always to thank God for you, brothers, loved by the Lord, because God chose you, there it is, as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through what? Our gospel. <laughs> How did that get in there? Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. God's special possession. Why? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So you think, well, why, why, am I, why am I part of this? It is for the sake of those lost people that you encounter every day in your work and school. That is why. That is why God has saved you and placed you where he has. That's what he did with Israel. He saved them. He brought them out of Egypt, put them right down in the middle of nations who didn't know him and said, live this way. Another sermon. Okay. Well, hey, I think we're good till Drew gets back, right? All right. <laughs> So, uh, inevitably, some hear this and, and are troubled by it and say, well, well, what if I'm not in? What if, what if I'm left out? Well, the very question is actually a good sign. It's a good question. But the only way really to be sure is to turn from your sin and put your hope in Jesus. That's, that's, that's how you make sure, okay? It's not complicated. You don't need to invest the degrees of God in his turn to the past. You need to turn from your sin and put your hope in Jesus. If you're struggling to come to faith, if you're wondering if you can trust Jesus, if you're wondering if he can save, you need only look at what we're seeing today and what happens after this. That all that he suffered and died, rising again with power to save, to give life, he can save you. He is willing to save you. He is more than willing to save you. He's promised those who come to me, I will never drive away. He's promised the one who believes in me has passed, does not come into judgment, but passes out of death and into life. So, let me urge you, plead with you today, put your hope in Jesus if you have not. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 11. He says, all things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son. And those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Sounds a lot like John 17. Huh, same guy. Shouldn't surprise us. Then he says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Same breath. He invites people, come to me, and I will give you rest. You say, that sounds like a, doesn't add up. Who cares? Jesus said it is true. <laughs> okay. It didn't bother him. He was smart enough to know things, you know, two things can't be true. He knew what he was saying. You can trust him. You don't have to have every mystery solved. Now we go back to John 17. We'll look in verse 3. Again, we're thinking through 
Jesus has made a request. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you for this purpose that he might give life to your people through his sufferings. And then in verse 3, he sort of unpacks what that means. That is, here he defines the life that he is going to give. It is, at its, at its most basic form, it is knowing God. It is knowing the Father through Jesus. He said, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So really the question for you is not so much from the, the trouble from a moment ago, but do you know the Lord? Do you know the Father? Or to put it another way, where are you trying to find life? Where do you find your identity? I could ask it this way. What is there in your life that if, if you lose it, life would, would lose meaning? You wouldn't want to live anymore. I think of a friend of mine, a new right after college. Uh, his life was wrapped up in his girlfriend. He, he couldn't live without her. And when she broke up with him, he, he took his life. I have another friend did the same thing. Like, their life is wrapped up in that relationship. We tend to find our identity. We tend to, to assign, think our lives have meaning because of something. Instead of Christ. And so, really, that's the challenge. That's the question this morning is what gives you identity? What what brings meaning to your life? What is there in your life that if you lost it, life would, would lose meaning? Life would not be worth living anymore, is it? And I have some things up here. Relationship, the example I've just given. Maybe it's your reputation. I see that among expats and, and missionaries. We, we kind of have a, there's a way we're supposed to live and be. And, and if, if somehow we fail, um, you know, we lose our, our reputation, our status. And that's a form of idolatry. Success, pleasure, status, power, power over others. I, you know, I don't know. I, I trust the Lord is speaking to your conscience about whatever that might be in your life. But the point is all of these things try to cause us to put our identity in them instead of in Christ. So let's move now to the, the second request Jesus makes. That's in, in verse 5. He says, And now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So let's be clear, Jesus is not asking to be no longer incarnate, that is, to be no longer human, to, to leave his physical body aside. He remains human forever. Now, that's important for us, because that means he is still the, the high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses. He is the, the one who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He is the one who who pleads, who intercedes for us now, and he is the one whose wounds, the only man-made thing in heaven we caused, plead for us in the final day. So yes, he is still human. Every, more human than we are. Okay. So what is he asking for then? He is asking to be restored to the glory, meaning, again, is, is slightly different. I, to be honest, when I started studying this, I thought it was the same thing and I was just lumping it all together and I realized there's, there's a bit of a different nuance here. He is asking to be restored to what he had before, to that, that sense of glory, that, that radiance that was his before. We saw a glimpse of it in the Transfiguration, Matthew 17. The, Peter, James, and John saw it and Elijah and Moses saw it too, but, you know, different. Um, but, you know, Jesus just, he began to radiate. They said, like gleaming, glowing, like, like lightning, flashing, just things difficult to describe. And he's asking to be restored permanently to that. It's like when Jesus took on humanity, he, he turned the, the brightness down. You know, you can do that like with your phone. You know, you can turn the brightness down so it doesn't irritate your eyes. At least that's what I'm telling. I have to find the button. I don't know. I have to get my kids to show me how. And it's not like now, now that he returns, it's like mission accomplished, time to return to base, turn the brightness up. He is ready to enter a new phase of ministry of interceding for us. So as he asks this, it is, it is like he's saying mission accomplished, returning to base. But how? Why, why does he say this? We back up to verse 4 and we see why. He says, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And so you kind of see that it makes sense. I brought you glory by finishing 
I brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. Now restore me to the glory I had before. Okay, you get the logic of that. So he seems to have three things in mind. First, he had lived a life that was pleasing to the Father in every way. He says this in John chapter 8, verse 29. I always do the things pleasing to the Father. You read that and you think, well, that is not me. I want to. That's not, I fail. But I'm so thankful that we have one who always did everything pleasing to the Father, who is, who is our advocate in that day, right? Isn't that beautiful? It is. Second thing it means is that he had given the Father's words to his disciples, and he's about to send them into the world, these disciples who are about to abandon him. Again, did you see the utter confidence in this? It's like I'm sending them into the world. Yeah, they've abandoned me for now. They will return, and they will be sent. And you, you read about it in John 20. He says, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. But he says it here, verse 18, as you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. And then there's a third thing, and that though he has not yet suffered, these events are so certain. Again, Judas is with the, and the soldiers likely on his way, even as he is uttering these words. So it is, it is going to happen. Though he has not yet suffered, he's not died, risen again, these things are so certain he could speak of them as accomplished already. Just like he said, I've sent the disciples into the world. That sending hadn't actually happened, but so certain, so settled, as if, if, as, as if it had, so he could speak about it in the past. Now, all of this leads to a, a glorious future for you and for me, because he says in, in verse 24, the final request, we'll see this another time, but just want to point, point it out to you. He makes this request. Father, I want those you have given me, that includes us in, in this room today, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am, to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the foundation, the creation of the world. That is astounding. This is what he asks. I want them to be with me. I want them to see my glory. And there is this inescapable, unbreakable relationship between glory and love, life and joy. He, he asked that we might see these things. This is, this is the future that awaits us. To see his glory. What will that be like? Well, to quote the song, you know, I can only imagine uh, what what I'm really not going to quote the song beyond the title, but you do imagine what what does that you read about the transfiguration, okay, you get the radiance you you see the wounds, and you know that they're there because of you and and he's not holding that against you he is he is your advocate he he suffers those wounds because. He loves you, and because he loves the Father, he loves you for the Father's sake. The Father loves you for Jesus' sake. It is this breathtaking outpouring of love that I pray awakens in us a sense of just awe and worship and delight in who the Lord is. All of this comes to us as a gift. <laughs> there is nothing you can do to earn this. You put your hope in Jesus and this, this, is, this is your future. So how do we respond to this today? First, uh, you know, I can't command you to delight in him, but I'm commanding you to delight in him. I can't, you know, I can't make you can't force this, but let me just urge you, seek the Lord. Don't come to that, seek to come to that place where you delight in him, where you know him as a father who is good and wise, the son who suffered for you, the spirit who makes it all real to you. Reflect on this, this shared glory and joy and life and love, this sacrificial life giving that the father is to us. 
When we think about the Trinity, he is, this is not this quaint theological technical concept. It is, it is who God is. He is our Father who gave His Son for us, sent His Spirit into us, and we will see His glory one day. So if you, if you lack delight, there, there's no technique, there's no three steps, there's no pill, there's no red pill, blue pill, <laughs> there's... It's, you just you seek him, but I I'm convinced he he wants this. He created you to delight in him. So let me just urge you: if you you say, well, I want to delight. I want to delight in the Lord more than I do. Okay, I do. I'm I'm not where I want to be. Here. Best I can tell, the path is time with him in his word. Remember what he says: I gave your words to those you gave me. That is how it happens. There's there's no download. It is it is truth from the Word made alive by the Spirit. As we move toward a time of communion and, and remembering what Jesus did for us, let me just urge you again to have in your mind as we, as we go through this, as it's there, the Father who glorified Jesus by having Him suffer for our sakes. It says in Isaiah 53, it pleased the Lord to crush Him. That's, that's, a, that's a statement that just boggles my mind. The Son whom He loves, the Son with whom He shares glory and life and joy and love, He crushes and takes pleasure in the crush to give us life, to give us, to allow us to see His glory, to know that love that has existed among them since before the world was ever created. So reflect upon the Father, upon Jesus, the Son who glorified the Father, by giving us life through his death and upon the spirit, a poor neglected person today makes these things real and precious to us today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do praise you this morning. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I pray you'll awaken in us a sense of your, del of your delight in who you are as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and awaken in us a sense of delight in who you are. And out of that love to, to trust you in times of uncertainty, in times of difficulty, in times of trial and sickness, and so much is uncertain in our lives. You are the constant, and I, I pray that you will lead us deeper and deeper into just utter delight in you day by day as your will unfolds for us. And we do look forward to the day when we will see your glory and understand the love that you have had for one another and for us forever. It boggles our minds. Thank you. Help us to enjoy it. Let it transform our lives, our relationships, our habits, our thoughts, our, our desires, our ambitions, every part of our lives. Please, for your sake, in Jesus' name, amen.